Good afternoon, everybody. I really very warmly welcome you to this joint panel event series, which is organized by the Institute of Physics and the German Physical Society. So very warmly welcome. And I would like to start to introduce myself briefly. I'm Ursula Franz from the Max Planck Institute of Plasma Physics. And I'm here in my role to be in the board, in the executive committee of the German Physical Society is being responsible for international activities. And I really very warmly welcome here you. So I would like to, to start off with a little bit explaining why we have this series. So this series was established last year. And the reason to establish that was basically we had the anniversary of the IPP, the 100 years anniversary, and the DPG's 175th anniversary. And we thought it would be good to start off with a series here. And we had the first online event on the climate change, a very important topic, of course, for all of us. So in these global issues, we, may, we recognize that they require really an interdisciplinary approach. And this was the reason why we invited panelists from diverse backgrounds in order to also stimulate important conversation. And in that sense, we, we thought it would be really good to continue to work together and to offer more online events on that. So we would like to address current issues that are important to the society. And today we have the topic entitled Robotics for Medicine. So if you have after this uh, presentation and, and question and discussion here other topics in mind, please feel free to send them to us. There will be an, a link later on. So I would like to thank you really very much for your interest. Enjoy the meeting. And with that, I really would like to hand over to Anne Bakenecker from the DPG and Bada Batai from IOP, who are both the chairs of the respective division group on the medical physics in the society. So please, Anna, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. And also from my side, thank you all for, for joining us today and being part of this event, uh, Robotics for Medicine. Um, as already mentioned, please use the Q&A window to, to ask questions to our panelists, uh, because we would really like to have uh, a lively discussion uh, after our presentations. Um, very briefly, uh, my name is Anna Barknecker. I studied physics in Münster and Heidelberg in Germany. And I specialized in medical physics and went for my PhD to the University of Lübeck. Uh, I'm working in the field of magnetic microrobotics uh, with magnetic particle imaging. And uh, currently I'm with the Fraunhofer IMTE in Lübeck. Uh, but as mentioned, uh, this is not the reason why I'm here. Uh, I'm also the chair uh, of the division of uh, radiation and medical physics of the German Physical Society. And uh, typically, we are organizing sessions related to medical physics at the DPG's spring meeting and also webinars together with our partner organization, the German Physical Society, uh, the German Medical Physics Society. Uh, and yeah, I joined uh, the organizing team uh, for today's event, uh, Robotics uh, for Medicine. And yeah, the research on, on medical robotics in, increased throughout the last years and uh, new robotic techniques enable a variety of, of advantages and new features uh, which have the potential to improve everyone's healthcare. And um, yeah, as always, so to say, uh, physics and physicists play an important role for, for pushing this field of research forward. And uh, therefore, I'm, I'm very happy to, to announce our today's speakers. Uh, and a panelist, uh, which at first is Dan Stoyanov, professor of uh, robot vision in the Department of Co Computer Science uh, at the University College London. Nina Randova, uh, consultant colorectal surgeon at the Royal Victoria Infirmary. And Mar Mariana Medina Sanchez, group leader of micro and nanobiomedical engineering group at the Leibniz Institute for Solid State Material Research in Dresden. And unfortunate, Christian Herzog cannot attend today, um, as we actually announced, which is very sadly, but uh, we will continue with our three panelists. And I would like to hand over to my colleague from IOP, Saitu Pahada. 
Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Ursel. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Bahada Bhatia. I'm co-chair of this event and chair of the IOP Medical Physics Group. Uh, I'm also a full-time medical physicist in the NHS, um, leading a portfolio of clinical AI uh, programs and covering aspects of non-ionizing safety. Um, the Medical Physics Group is all about translation into clini clinical practice, starting with academic research or jointly with industry. We promote all areas of applied physics with potential for medical applications and encourage and foster the exchange of ideas and collaborations. I'm very pleased to support this event and would like to thank my colleagues and our speakers um, uh, and um, um, will introduce you um, them very shortly. There will be a chance for the panel to answer questions from the audience um, during the Q&A session, which follows the introductions. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please do so by typing in the Q&A box, which is found at the bottom of your tool panel. And we will try to get through as many as possible. It is with, therefore with great pleasure that I hand over to our panelists to introduce their areas of work and their current role. Uh, so if I can start with please, uh, Professor Dan Stoyanov, please. Thank you, um, Harar. Thank you, Anna. And thank you everyone for uh, being here today and also for the opportunity to uh, join this discussion and to speak to you about robotics in, in, in medicine. Um, uh, my name is Dan Stoyanov. I am a professor in computer science at uh, University College London, and I'm also director of our Welcome EPSRC Centre for uh, Surgical and Interventional Sciences. My research interests, my personal research interests, have really been around surgical technology and specifically robotics and AI um, as applied to surgery. And of course, we have a consultant uh, robotic surgeon uh, joining us today. So I think Nina will give us the clinical, uh, the clinical perspectives on surgical robotics. Um, I can give the, the more technology focused uh, perspective. So I've worked with surgical robots for about 20 years now. I did my PhD with the first um, surgical robot in the UK. Um, at the time, it was being used for heart surgery and uh, thoracic surgery. And of course, over the years, this technology pivoted to other parts of the anatomy, uh, but it's now finding its way back to hearts and to uh, lungs. Um, and uh, at the time we were very interested in capturing the video from these robots. It was, it was uh, some of the first um, technology uh, to deploy uh, stereoscopic or sometimes trinocular uh, scopes in order to be able to observe the surgical site uh, with more than one camera, uh, which meant that we could do artificial intelligence on those images and extract information that's uh, normally not available. Um, and so we were doing research on uh, mapping the surgical environment using the cameras, recovering the 3D shape of the organs, the position of instruments, um, and so on. And, and that's continued over the years. Um, it's still not a solved problem, despite the enormous advances in artificial intelligence uh, that are happening at a you know, stellar uh, pace uh, today. Um, but there's still a lot of problems uh, to solve there. Um, and uh, I think it's a, it's a great time to be working in that area because um, there's more and more surgical robots deployed, uh, more and more laparoscopic surgery used, uh, you know, just generally. And so there's a tremendous amount of data uh, for us to work with as computer scientists, as roboticists, um, and a really nice synergy between, between the clinical adoption of such technology um, and the opportunity to uh, think about what the next generation of these systems is going to, going to look like. Um, today, uh, I tend to work in uh, areas that are not just uh, AI specific. Um, and so we build some novel devices. Um, we're looking at novel ways of imaging. Um, so uh, white light is the predominant modality that's used in surgery today. So it's just direct vision of the surgical side, but there's a lot of interest in 
different types of interventional and surgical imaging. And um, of course, the biomedical engineering community and the medical physics community have been developing these techniques for a very long time. And so uh, I think it's probably around the, the right time that uh, these technologies will see uh, adoption as well. Um, in, in addition to that, um, different surgical devices are uh, becoming easier to fabricate. Um, so we might see uh, energy instruments that have capabilities beyond what we see today. We might see flexibility uh, or uh, soft uh, robotic instruments uh, that are very different to what we see today. So I think these are some of the um, some of the, uh, the exciting work that is uh, still very much in academic research, but may find its way uh, into uh, patients and uh, into widespread use and hopefully uh, have a positive effect on, on the way that we conduct interventional healthcare. Um, so I've just given a, a bit of a blunderbuss on the various uh, uh, aspects that I think are interesting and that we and my colleagues at, at UCL are, are working on. Um, the other uh, point I, sh I should probably mention is that um, I, we do also work with industry, so I'm affiliated with uh, Digital Surgery, which is part of uh, Medtronic, um, where some of the AI techniques that we've been developing over the last 20 years or so uh, are seeing productization um, in, in the sense of trying to understand analytics of what happens during surgery, uh, trying to use that very rich video signal in order to uh, provide some quantitative idea of um, particular practices or uh, the performance of a particular unit or even maybe more global um, metrics. So I think that's really exciting, really interesting, because I think uh, academically it's sometimes challenging to reach that scale um, and to really analyze data from all over the world. Um, and then there's also a number of other uh, exciting commercial initiatives. Um, there's a lot of AI being used in endoscopy, uh, in upper GI and lower GI. Um, and, um, and, I, and I think that's another exciting space that uh, may be interesting to discuss today. Uh, so we'll probably uh, stop there and hand over, over to uh, my colleague. Um, and I look forward to a vibrant discussion. Bahadar, you're, you're on mute, I think. Schoolboy error. Thank you, Dan. And, uh, thank you for your uh, uh, introduction. Um, just a reminder to the audience that if you wish to ask questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the panel. Um, we now go on to Ms. Nina Randawa, please. And uh, if you'd like to um, introduce yourself and your um, scope of work, please. Hi, thank you for the invite. Uh, my name is Nina. I'm one of the colorectal surgeons working in Newcastle in the Royal Victoria Infirmary. So I trained actually as a biochemist first, but was not really happy staring in a lab and incubator for a very long. And after my research, I decided I needed more human contact. So trained as a medical student and chose to do surgery. And as part of my training, I was quite drawn into robotics. And I am one of the few people, actually, I'm one first person in the UK to do robotic lower GI or colorectal surgery purely for non-cancer reasons. So there are different disease pathologies for doing robotic surgery in colorectal. It's mainly divided into what we call cancer or benign, and I'm purely benign focus simply because my patients are quite younger so average age group of my patient will be 20 19 to 20 year olds and these are the patients who will be having quite an extensive bowel surgery and the benefits of robotic are much better seen in these patients than in any other patient so far and the way I can describe is that most of the cancer patients when they come for surgery regardless of what stage of their cancer is their mindset is different, so they just want to be cleared of cancer. So they come in, have their bowel surgery, and as if as a result of life, they went to have a pelvic surgery, and you consent them for having injury to the pelvic nerves, which are for their bladder or bowel function or sexual function. If there is a damage to that, their expectations are quite different. They are more focused on being cancer free rather than having all these bodily functions affected their expectations are 
far different from my patients who've got lifelong conditions such as Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease, which can affect any part of the gut from mouth to anus. And you tell a 20 year old that they can no longer have a normal sexual function because their pelvic nerves are being damaged. That's a quite a significant outcome and a quite a significant change to their expectation. So over the last couple of decades, we've been doing this surgery laparoscopically with a keyhole and the benefits have been that it's minimally invasive. So they have smaller incisions, so they are in a lot less pain, so they are much faster recovery to their normal activity. But it, these, this is a two dimensional wheel and often in a, with the current demographics of patients, it's a obese population now. So as a surgeon, you're trying to operate in a narrow male pelvis and then often the risk of pelvic nerve injury is much higher. So the robot comes into play in the sense it still has the benefits of what you'd expect in a minimally invasive surgery, that, but added benefit that you get a three-dimensional view. So you have a much better view of every single anatomy that you can see. You have an extra pair of hands so that you're not relying on an assistant to help you with the surgery. And on top of that, and the main benefit, which hasn't been looked at with the laparoscopic surgery, is an ergonomics for the surgeon. So I would have done a, what we call a completion proctectomy or pan proctoplectomy, where you remove the entire colon and back passage. That's roughly a five to six hour long operation. And if you were doing laparoscopically, I would have been in three different orientations. It's time consuming, but it's quite energy consuming for yourself as a surgeon and physically energy consuming. Whereas now I can do the same operation, probably faster, better view, and I'm sitting there comfortably so that by the time I've finished, I don't have a sore back. And actually that's made a huge difference because over the last decade, laparoscopic surgeons, they were having quite a lot of incidences of uh, back problems. So this is a device which not only provides a patient benefit, but actually it's quite a good benefit for the surgeons involved as well. So for me, it's, it's definitely a winner. And going forward, a lot of my patients being younger, they have been on social media, et cetera. So they're all aware of these new technologies up and coming. And actually they will almost want these surgeries because they can read about the benefits. They've spoken to people who've had these surgeries. So it, it, it's a no brainer that if you can provide them a smaller incision surgery with less risk of complication, which can be life-changing and a better quality of life for the surgeon, I think it's a winner all along. So that's a bit about me, and I'll pass you back to the panel. Thank you, Nina. Um, we now go on to Dr. Mariana Medina Sanchez. Mariana. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. So I, I will like to show a short presentation. I will share my screen if it's OK. So I just seen my, my slides. Yes, we can see your slide, Mariana. Uh, Mariana, we're seeing the back of your, so your notes as well. Would you mind okay. clicking on display settings and swap the view? No. That's great. Okay, Thank great. You. Sorry. Yeah, so as, um, as it was mentioned before, I come from the um, Leibniz Institute uh, in Dresden, Germany. Um, this is an institute that is focused on material science at solid state physics. Uh, my background actually is in mechatronics engineering, but I have been um, going through different disciplines all uh, during my career. Uh, I did a, a master degree on nanotechnology and my PhD was in biomedical engineering. So it's already quite interdisciplinary um, uh, background. Uh, and um, nowadays uh, we are working, uh, my group uh, and me are working on medical micro robots, which are basically tiny devices, very simple ones, not as the ones we know at the big scale that integrate sensors, actuators, um, processing units, but uh, rather simple like uh, microtubes, helical structures uh, with some uh, functionalities. Um, 
the let's say the the intelligence of these systems uh, rely mainly on the design and the the material uh, that we are employing uh, to provide them a, a function a medical function yeah, so our motivation mainly is to improve uh, assisted reproduction technology success and in general gynecological healthcare by employing uh, engineer micro robots that can perform diagnosis and therapy uh, locally um, in, in, in the reproductive organ, for example, um, to help sperm cells with motion deficiencies to reach the oocyte in vivo or to transport uh, in vitro fertilized embryos back to the fallopian to, to let it develop under more natural conditions to uh, increase the implantation rates or to deliver some drugs uh, to treat uh, gynecological diseases or cancers. So we envision a system like uh, I show here in this image where we have a, a, an electromagnetic um, coil system um, coupled to an imaging system where we can uh, do uh, in real time imaging and manipulation of these uh, anti-ether uh, micro robots uh, inside the organs. And so why we are working in this field, because uh, is, uh, infertility is a problem that is affecting uh, a great population over the world and uh, is affecting equally males and females. And uh, the conventional techniques that are used nowadays are uh, in vitro fertilization and intracytoplasmatic sperm injection. They have very high um, success rates in terms of fertilization. So it's even um, above uh, 87%. But the problem comes when uh, these uh, embryos or fertilized all sites are transferred back to the to the uterus, uh, and here is where um, many uh, implantation um, failure happens, and um, the the birth per transfer is still, are still very low, below twenty percent or lower, depending on the on the on the hormone stimulation. And so that's why we 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 are let's say uh, envisioning uh, the development of of different systems. For example, here to uh, transport immotile sperm cells. This is called astenosospermia, or to guide sperm cells that are motile, but the the count is very low. So uh, in order to increase the chances of reaching the oocyte in in vivo conditions. So we can, uh, depending on the male infertility problem in this case, we can uh, design different um, structures uh, like microtubes, microhelixes that have a very thin layer of magnetic, ferromagnetic material that react to external magnetic fields. We can guide them, propel them in a remote way. Um, so these are some examples in the lab. So for the first um, a case where sperms are motile, but in low count, we fabricate these microtubes, uh, which are made of a um, bio, bio compatible polymer. They can be also biodegradable. And we can coat them with a very thin layer of iron uh, that respond to external magnetic fields. And we can guide them precisely uh, with very weak magnetic fields in the order of few millitesla. And uh, we have optimized these designs so that they can operate efficiently in ex vivo oviduct fluid because, yeah, so far we know that in vitro settings differs significantly from the in vivo scenario. So uh, we first have to optimize uh, several technical aspects, like, for example, um, being able to move these structures in, in highly viscoelastic media with a lot of cellular debris and obstacles. And that's why we have uh, redesigned these, these scaffolds, make them more uh, hydrodynamic um, uh, with less weight so that they can also squeeze and move efficiently in, in a real oviduct fluid. Uh, we have also uh, performed several rheological studies so that we can um, achieve the maximum performance as possible. In the second case, where you know, sperms are immotile, so we fabricated uh, a small uh, artificial flagella. These are microhelixes again that we actuate with rotating magnetic fields uh, to capture immotile sperm cells, which are still uh, viable and functional and uh, in in vitro fertilization labs, they are used or they are injected directly into the cytoplasm of the oocyte uh, to create an embryo. Uh, so in order to do that, we use a technique technique that is called to photon uh, lithography, where we um, uh, can polymerize uh, photoresist in a three D um, fashion uh, with a very small. Um, um, spatial resolution and we can uh, create these helixes with different materials and coat them again with a magnetic layer 
uh, we optimize in this case the geometry, the number of pitch, diameter, everything to propel um, single sperm cells uh, with velocities close to the one of healthy sperm's uh, velocity. Um, in this case, as the sperms are immotile, are difficult to distinguish between the living sperms uh, and that's why we perform different tests like uh, the iposmotic swelling test or, or viability test where we can distinguish the sperms which are uh, live, living with intact acrosome that is important for the later fishing with the oocyte. And here is a, a, an optical microscope video where we manage to capture um, single sperm cells, transport them towards an oocyte, and by inverting the magnetic field, we can uh, release them. Uh, but all these um, approaches have been um, um, meant for transporting single sperm cells, but we know that uh, in vivo conditions, about 100 to 1,000 sperms are found nearby the fertilization site. So because uh, that reason, we are aiming to transport multiple sperm cells because uh, so far it's not very well known which are the, the key characteristics of sperms to, to, to fertilize the oocyte. So we, we are working here a little bit with the statistics. And uh, that's why we're exploring different strategies where we can, for example, uh, self-assemble uh, single uh, microtubes in a sperm train um, fashion by dipole-dipole interaction or um, just manipulate them individually uh, simultaneously or create caps which are multifunctional like the ones I show in the right side where we have uh, multiple cavities where the sperm scar and couple to, to, to them. And if we have an hydrogel inside it, we can um, uh, actuate it and uh, release the sperms on demand. Uh, there is another approach to transport multiple sperms. Here is a microflake based of protein and hyaluronic acid, which is used to capture mature uh, sperm cells with intact DNA. So uh, in this case, we are also using the micro robots uh, as an in situ uh, selection uh, or high quality sperm selection uh, method. Uh, prior transport. And uh, we can see that the, the microflakes that we created um, can trap up to 100 sperm cells very efficiently within a few minutes. And, and uh, we can uh, deliver these microflakes nearby the target location. It can be the old site or if we use them for drug delivery nearby the, the tumor tissue. And um, due to local, the presence of local proteases and enzymes that are in the, in the oviduct, uh, this flake is degraded and the sperms can be released and uh, preserve their motility and ultimately uh, perform the function that they are intended to do. Yeah, we can also use uh, additional magnetic carriers to transport them or embed some magnetic particles within the microflake to, to move it forward. And finally, I want to show you some latest results because um, we, we have been working the past uh, five years on optimizing this, uh, these uh, structures to carry sperm cells. Uh, of different characteristics in different media. And uh, now we are trying to move towards small animal trials. And uh, in order to, to, to achieve that, we should be able to visualize single micro robots with very high spatial resolution, temporal resolution in deep tissue. And we have explored different imaging techniques, but this one to us was one of the most promising, which is called photoacoustics that it combines the advantages of ultrasound in terms of penetration depth and um, uh, the advantages of optical imaging in terms of spatial resolution and molecular specificity. So here, uh, by employing uh, these electromagnetic coil systems, we can uh, control the velocity of these single micro robots uh, in vitro. Also, we have been able to see them uh, in ex vivo tissue below one centimeter, two centimeter press, um, uh, chicken breast tissue, and finally uh, in uh, living mice uh, into the uterus cavity as well as into the bladder of the, of the mouse. So this was already a promising uh, result so that uh, we can uh, start uh, planning our experiments towards uh, assisted in vivo fertilization.
And with that, yeah, I would like just to finalize uh, this, sorry, this was also another approach to we, or another aspect that is important in our um, community, which is uh, the, the control, the precise control of these uh, micro robots. And we are working in different algorithms to do uh, reliable feedback control, and we can bring them uh, precisely to the location of interest. Yeah, so with that, I would like to thank my, my group members, especially my students, Frederic, Fatima, and Asam, who has, uh, de have developed this, these experiments so far, and of course, our main collaborators and funding agencies. Yep. So if you have any further question or we can discuss later in the panel. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mariana, and thank you all for, for your in inspiring introductions uh, to our, our today's topic. Um, let me remind you that you prompt your uh, questions to the Q&A box. Um, Bahada, do we have already some, some questions? Yes, we have one question and a couple of questions, but uh, uh, I think the first one is for um, uh, Mariana, and it's around trace amounts of iron in micro robots, do they pose a risk to fetal development, Mariana? Have you looked into that at all? Um, so you mean to the embryo development? Sorry, yes. I didn't hear it very well. Okay, yes. um, yeah, so, so far we have not evaluated this yet. So uh, we have transport um, early embryos with uh, another type of micromotor that I didn't show here, a spiral-like micro robot. Uh, but um, we have not seen any, um, uh, say, uh, obvious effect. And also we have evaluated the cytotoxicity of these uh, scaffolds and the materials that we are employing, and we have not observed any uh, detrimental effect. However, in vivo, things are very different, no? and that's why we are initiating these early experiments to establish the technique in, in small animals like mice. And yeah, we expect to, to get more information about uh, immunological responses and also embryo development and capability in the near future. <laughs> I hope to, to tell you more about this later on. Thank you, Mariana. Anna? Uh, yes, we, we have uh, another question uh, concerning uh, about the, the ethical point of view. So uh, what could be the ethical concerns using robots in medicine more extensively in the future, even if using them increases the chance of a better outcome in surgery treatment? I think that is a perfect question for, for Nina. Hi, thank you. Um, I think... As it stands at the moment, this robot is still very much human controlled. So I, it, it's just another instrument that I have a full control of. So it's not automated. So at the moment, it's just another surgical instrument, which I would, as if I'm using my own hand. So currently there are no issues with ethics at the moment, but I'll let Dan answer to the next one because with the new robots being introduced with artificial intelligence, I think that probably brings a bit more question about ethics because the current robot, which is currently the state of art, which I use, it's still very much under my control. It follow, And it's my hands that are moving and not the actual robotic hands in a sci-fi way. But going forward, and I'll get Dan to answer the rest of this for me, that there will be ethics concerns when they are the robots are becoming more and more automated with the little surg surgeon's control. Dan? I think, I think um, ethics is a really important consideration. And um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that we lost our panelists who, who could have answered in a, in a much more ethical, uh, from an ethical perspective. I think from a technology perspective, we're still stuck on solving the technological barriers and kind of getting some of this uh, tech to work. Um, but I think there are very interesting considerations. Um, I think automation of, of actual tasks or subtasks um, is not one of the primary drivers of, of what people want to achieve today. You know, autonomous surgery 
it may be really important if we are on Mars and there's not, you know, if Nina is not there uh, or if we're taking space flights or this kind of stuff. Um, but at the moment today, there's much more realistic challenges and, and much more pressing challenges for society and for, for uh, surgery and interventions uh, to, to address. I think um, the AI systems that are coming into play, um, you know, for example, you, you have AI to detect uh, lesions in endoscopy. Uh, and I think the ethical considerations there are, um, you know, what, what data was that AI system trained on? Is there potential bias in that system? So we, we know that from uh, images that are recognized by the general population, by all of us, so we can all recognize faces, people, these sorts of things. Uh, well, if we feed data on faces and of people to AI systems um, without carefully considering what the distribution of that data is, then those systems can become very biased. We've seen a number of examples of systems that may discriminate racially, of systems that may profile in a particular way. It's not the algorithms and the systems that do this intentionally. It's just the underlying data that they're that they're fed with, and I think there are really important ethical considerations, um, and um, you know they, they need to be they need to be carefully handled in any productization or widespread use of such technology. Um, and some of it is very difficult to answer because I don't think you know while we can discern what understandable data looks like, pictures of faces and so on. Um, it's a bit more difficult. Um, I don't think anyone's done a, a widespread studies to really show whether the spectral characteristics of colons in the, uh, you know, in, in Asia is different to those in the, uh, in uh, the USA or in the, in the Americas. Um, so I think some of it requires fundamental work and, and I think some of it is covered by uh, regulatory practices. So uh, bodies like the FDA or to, to be able to obtain the CE mark, you do need to demonstrate uh, that generalization and how that technology is used in different settings. So in community hospitals, in, um, in uh, referral centers and so on and so on. So I think some of the, you know, the, the guidelines are there uh, in order to be able to ensure that these systems are behaving um, well. Uh, but of course, we need to bear in mind what the potential implications may be. Uh, the bias in those systems could be the downstream use uh, of those systems, what that could be, and whether there could be consequences that we hadn't thought about. Uh, so uh, I don't think that answers your question, but I hope it sheds some perspectives uh, to it. I think I agree. We are away from it being an autonomous system yet for it to have any ethical obligations yet because it's still very much another surgical instrument which is an extension of my hands and I very much control that it has no autonomy so and I will do the same operation that I would do if I was to do same surgery 10 years ago so I think in that respect it, it has it hasn't really raised any ethical concerns from the surgical perspective yet and Nina, before we go on to um, the next question, Nina, um, what ethical concerns do patients have when the surgery is being performed? What what concerns do they have, and how do you do do, do you address those? I think that varies from patient to patient, and what their case is for the surgery. And I think more importantly, and generally, with any technology that's involved, the common ethical concern patients I come across is that the imaging that's being used. So any procedure that gets recorded, that it can only be used for, and it will be anonymized, it will be kept on the trust database and not on, because there will be people wanting to record for their building up their case series, etc., to show nationally, international. It's more of a patient confidentiality that their data is not being used without their consent for any purpose that they haven't consented to. So that, that's the only ethics concern that I often come across. And I usually consent patients for routinely that if we were to take any imaging, any recording, it will be used solely for educational purposes and it will be all anonymized. And if it's ever going into press, it will not go into press without a written consent from the patient. 
maybe yes. I also want. Sorry. Yes. Yes, please, Mariana. Sorry, it's a different, completely different perspective because, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in contrast to uh, Nina and Dan, they are already using these instruments in clinic. We are still in a, in a basic research uh, level, uh, but as we are, uh, let's say, aiming for uh, new technologies in assisted fertilization, this uh, has already raised a lot of concerns because. Of course, you are working with the embryos, no? And at some point, we want to to create life <laughs> with a new methodology, and this has uh, this uh, has a lot of controversy, uh, and in different countries, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, area is treated in a very different way. For example, in Germany, there are a lot of restrictions to use uh, human uh, gametes for for these kind of experiments, even for genetically modified um, uh, modifications and um, but we know, for example, in England, this is a little bit more, more, more flexible, let's say, uh, but there are a lot of concerns that we have to consider. And uh, even just for preclinical trials, uh, it's, it's very important to, to involve an ethical commission in an early stage so that we can um, work towards the translation of these technologies uh, from, from the very beginning. And, and maybe if not, possible to implement this in, in a short term in assisted fertilization, use them for other um, uh, relevant diseases like cancer, where there is maybe no other possible treatment uh, available or in cases or infertility also in cases where uh, all have been tried like this um, repeated implantation failures where, where all the different available treatments have been already tested. And this is the only alternative, let's say, that could be helpful for the patient to 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 have a, a successful pregnancy so yeah <laughs> i just wanted to add that yeah in this field is a little bit more critical and it's still very fundamental research hmm. maybe just a very very quick question as you said uh, the, the surgical robotics is already in in clinics uh, the very first time but uh, you are with your research a little bit more far away um, how far away and uh, what are the steps uh, your research needs to to cope uh, in order to uh, yeah really go into into patients yeah so first of all uh, yeah if you will initiate animal experiments you first have to optimize your your robots in in vitro settings or in vitro mimicking organs uh, as uh, with the conditions as more realistic as possible because we also have to follow these three r's uh, principles of uh, reduction refining and uh, and um, recycling right <laughs> So, and, and uh, in order to, to be able to initiate a, a small animal experiments, you have to uh, have already something very well optimized and, and tested all possible uh, failures in order to minimize the, 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 the mice numbers that you need or the animal numbers that you need for, for proving your, your system. And there are different levels also at the animal uh, experiment uh, levels. So you first have to do explorative research to establish the technique. Then you have to really prove uh, clinic, uh, uh, prove that your method is better than the conventional ones. And for that, you need very statistically relevant data. And just designing this experiment is a complete new world. <laughs> I can't say because I'm initiating also this process and it's, it's very complex. And if you want to go one day to human, you have to, to overcome all these steps uh, in a successful way and, and, and uh, and uh, there are probably many, many individual experiments that you have to, to design in first in mice uh, before you can uh, move to large mammals. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, the other aspect is the imaging. So at the moment, we, we count with this imaging system that is uh, suitable for small animals. But if we want to translate it to human, uh, at the moment, there are not um, at least for what we are expecting, uh, which is real time uh, imaging and control of these devices, there are not a, a suitable technique at the moment with high spatial resolution. There are other approaches where you can use autonomous micro robots and they can reach by themselves the area of interest and then you can monitor the final location. So for that, you don't need real time. And in that case, you can use MRI or, or nuclear medicine techniques and would be maybe easy to translate them uh, uh, towards larger um, samples. But uh, 
uh, yeah, in our case, it's very critical, the real time control, because we are manipulating and controlling the, the velocity and the position by external magnetic fields while observing them. Um, yeah, so what I can say, so it's very important also the material selection, uh, all uh, studies first in vitro and in vitro mimicking system in the small animals, and, and then involve uh, as early as possible all the, the uh, ethical commissions and, um, and, and um, agencies uh, uh, to initiate this process at the very earliest stage, you know, that you are not really maybe suggesting something that is not really useful or that is not replacing uh, or um, it's not a good alternative of already um, very well established and efficient existing therapies, no? Um, thank you, Mariana. That's very interesting around the imaging side, which is uh, brings up one of the questions in the Q&A box. And maybe that's a question for Dan. What type of 3D imaging is employed in robotic surgery? And is it possible that surgical planning techniques might be developed that could lead to more autonomous surgical robots. So, Dan, I think you did mention white light imaging, but what other sorts of imaging are available uh, for use with the, the robot? Um, so, I guess it depends whether you mean preoperative or intraoperative uh, imaging. So, preoperatively, most procedures, and, and I think Nina would be able to comment best, most, pro most procedures that go on to uh, have surgery with a surgical robot would, would mean that the patients would have been uh, diagnosed with either CT or with MRI. Um, and so there would be tomographic preoperative imaging. And there are a number of solutions emerging now for creating models of the anatomy and visualizing those models intraoperatively, um, either in the console or with, with, other, with other means. Um, so kind of doing the medical image processing, the segmentation, the modeling, and, and then uh, having that displayed, which I think is, is really nice. And I think it, it's the technology is out there it, and it should be it should be used more widely. Um, and I think it will have an impact on, um, you know, just informing decisions during the procedure just in a slightly better way, because, you know, I've, I've seen years ago, Printouts stuck to the robotic console of plans, you know, manually drawn plans, and and I think we have technology to 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 go way beyond that and to have much much better accessibility of such information. In terms of intraoperative uh, imaging, um, there's drop-in ultrasound probes, there's um, fluorescence, um, so ICG. Uh, people are exploring other agents. Um, there's uh, other probes as well, less frequently used, but uh, I think a really Im important innovation. So uh, beta and gamma probes that might be able to uh, get a signal from a radio, uh, radio pharmaceutical that is injected during the procedure. It's quite complicated to do procedures like that because some clinical teams don't like injecting radioisotopes during surgery. Um, the sensitivity of those, uh, uh, of those um, agents is not very clear. The sensitivity of the probes also you know, needs further study um, and also understanding you know, if, if the probe is picking up uh, particles that are emitted from somewhere, getting that information into something that's clinically meaningful to make a decision because you're either detecting residual disease that's left over um, or you know, targeting where the, where the disease is. I think there's workflow issues in, in using technology like that. Um, those are things that are on the market today. So they're, they're regulated devices and exist. There's a number of really exciting technologies that are more in development, but are very close to being on the market. Um, so uh, ultrasound that's potentially 3D, ultrasound that's potentially optical, and so you can get it into places in a, in a different way. Photo endoscopic photoacoustic imaging, um, there's, you know, there's a number of groups doing that, including one at UCL. Um, there's other, other types of uh, imaging, multispectral, uh, polarization resolved endoscopy. We've done human trials with some of those uh, imaging um, uh, approaches. Um, so it's possible. I think utilizing that signal very effectively is still a work in progress and we really need those uh, clinical studies uh, in order to really pinpoint where the value 
of each specific imaging technology will, will uh, come to fruition for different specialties. Um, but I think it's it's something that's definitely uh, uh, a really, really important area of development. And it's something that will be uh, available in the, in the coming years, I'm sure. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and um, Anna, please. Uh, yeah, we, we have uh, some more questions. I would put two questions together. Both are for Mariana. And um, the first one is uh, uh, an, an understanding question on um, how the, the sperm can be moved and oriented and uh, actually connected. Um, uh, and the second question um, is, um, are your micromotors small enough to be guided through the circulatory systems, for example, for targeted drug delivery? Okay, so for the first one, um, the coupling depends on the design. So we have, uh, for example, for the motile sperm cells, uh, they they couple to to the microtubes if they are designed on the right size uh, within a few uh, minutes just by themselves because they they are they like to swim in in, in small cavities so they they just find a way to, towards the microtubes. Uh, but we are also uh, functionalizing these microtubes or, or these um, carriers with the molecules like hyaluronic acid, which is used to attract uh, sperm cells which are mature with intact DNA. Um, yeah, so we either do it mechanically or uh, biochemically, the, the, the binding of this, uh, the synthetic cargo and sperm cells and what was the other question sorry uh, if the system is small enough to be guided through the I, circulatory system for targeted drug delivery yeah so i didn't show all what we have done so far but uh, we already have a report uh, a manuscript where we I use the sperms uh, uh, for uh, carrying heparin loaded uh, nanoliposomes uh, in the circulatory system because the sperms have the ability to swim against flow. This is called rheotaxis, uh, and uh, they, they swim very efficiently um, in, in bloodstream, in particular in micro vessels, not, not in big, uh, in big um, channels, but uh, they are able to overcome the flow and be guided with magnetic fields. And we can uh, either uh, carry drugs within the sperm nucleus or on the on the micro cap, uh, functionalize the micro cap with this uh, liposomes that I mentioned you uh, containing heparin, and we have demonstrated in vitro the removal of blood clots uh, with this uh, sperm hybrid micromotors. Uh, so yeah, uh, in part the, the treatment was uh, biochemical, but also the tail beating of sperms is, is really uh, helping <laughs> in this process. Thank you, Mariana. Um, we have a question really around the role of robots in helping other healthcare professionals like nurses in patient care. Um, could robots help the problem of care staff shortage in an aging population? And if I could maybe go to Dan first of all, followed by Nina. Uh, I think it's a great question and, and a really important one at the moment. I've just, um, uh, over the past week or so, I've, I've, I've been involved in several discussions where um, certain countries are really facing crisis uh, moments in terms of uh, having sufficient staff for um, caring for the for the elderly population. Um, of course, COVID has brought its own problems. Uh, migration and political decisions have brought their own problems on top of that. Um, so I think ro robotics could have a role, um, whether it's um, it's the, the right solution. I don't know whether the cost is, is appropriate today. I also don't, don't quite know. Um, but I think that assistive robotic technologies, for example, something that enables one human to look after either more patients or to look after a patient better or to avoid injury so that care, caretakers or care staff are not off sick because they're having to lift patients that are heavy or that are unable to move in an appropriate way. I think uh, technology to assist uh, care caregiving staff um, is, is definitely a really, really important area of, of development. Um, 
and I think some of those systems will will emerge. So I, I don't have all the numbers, but I, I, I remember as I heard them about a week ago, I was slightly gobsmacked by uh, the number of people that have to take time off because of injuries due to having to flip over patients. And obviously with COVID, with loads of patients on uh, ventilators and being in beds for long periods of time, that was an issue. Um, I, think, um, I think robotics can definitely help uh, there. Um, and and then in in the community in, in care centers, um, I've seen a number of quite imaginative depictions of what caretaking robots may look like. Uh, I've seen some amazing stuff that's been done in Japan. Um, I think in order for those very elaborate solutions to really make sense, uh, it needs to be not just a robot design uh, question. It needs to be a kind of system design. So the whole home needs to be designed in a different way so that the robot or any mobility systems that you develop are able to operate properly um, in, in that setting. So I think it's kind of bigger, bigger question. And th there are some exciting initiatives about building kind of whole cities or buildings uh, in, in that fashion, which is, which is very interesting. Um, so I'm hopeful, uh, but I think there are a lot of uh, the, the, the more people that need to interact with this technology, the more complicated the issues become. And, um, and, and I think so. there's no easy win, but uh, I'm very hopeful that we can start um, helping uh, caregiving staff better and also helping patients better. And Nina, what's your experience from the healthcare environment? Um, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. I think from, I agree with what Dan said that I think currently with the staff shortage, the cost involved in designing these systems almost becomes an ethical concern that you're trying to, the limited NHS budget, you really have to ration that yes, I agree. Maybe long-term wise, it would help in providing facilities both for the patient and care providers to have a robotic system avail available, but currently with a limited NHS budget, which is shrinking every year. It almost is an ethical dilemma the way you're gonna put the money in. Are you gonna use that to design a robot or are you gonna actually use that to attract more care home staff so that there's a less sickness and less staff shortage? Yeah, I mean, we, we do have, sorry, go ahead. No, so I was just going to say, but in an ideal world, like, I mean, the commonest things that we see here is that with aging and obese population, the, one of the biggest sickness cause on the wards is a back problem. Despite having what we call hoist to move a patient, that still requires a lot of input from the staff to actually hook the patient to these transfer devices. So it would be a perfect starting tool to have something that requires limited or minimal strain on the staff's back but we are quite far away from that yet yeah i was just going to say we have got have seen robots so uh, which provide mm -hmm. emotional support for patients um using ai and we do have mobile robots which look after um uh deep cleaning of wards so using ultraviolet disinfection or hydrogen peroxide but I don't think I've actually come across any assistive robotics for, for lifting and handling, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. No, okay. Uh, Anna. Uh, yes, you, you already mentioned the, the ethical point of view and we have uh, another uh, question concerning about the, the ethical aspects. Uh, it's, it's really a pity that our expert on the ethical aspects uh, could not join us today, but maybe Nina uh, with the help of Dan can answer this question. Um, what's about applications in which the robot shall be positioned fully autonomously? For example, posi positioning uh, ultrasound probes in radiotherapy, which safety aspects need to be fulfilled? Um, I mean, I think it just comes back to the same uh, discussion we had. The current system we have is still very much human-led. And I think going forward, and as with current radiotherapy treatments anyway, it is still very... So every patient will have an imaging done to identify where the tumour is. And then they come in for their mapping where the radiotherapy markers are placed. So I think... A robot will only help and guide that, but it all depends on 
what the parameters were set for the robot to begin with. And that's still, we, I mean, Dan can fill in with this more than I can, but I don't think we are at a stage where the, we are anywhere near having an autonomous robotic in the healthcare, especially for such a complex treatment planning as in radiotherapy. Thank you, Nina. Um, some questions for Mariana. Uh, I think we you have partially answered some of these already, but uh, are there any are there biological risks to the embryo with this method when you combine a sperm with a cell and that would not combine naturally? Um, and there's also a question around: Are there other types of micro robots intervening in the body that you could imagine in order to cure which kind of illnesses? So with the use of micro robots could it be used for example in uh ophthalmology where you just yeah, do sure. perform surgery for uh, the back of the retina okay yeah so for for the first question um yeah we don't expect uh, any significant differences compared to the conventional in vitro fertilization procedures because uh, yeah they are already quite well established and uh, in in the first case you you put in very small um um, drops and confinements, uh, a huge amount of sperm cells together with the all sites uh, to fertilize them in vitro. And on the other side, you, you capture the immortal sperm cells and inject them directly into the all site cytoplasm by, by a huge injection, <laughs> a huge uh, needle. So I would say in the case of the micro robots, uh, the, the only difference is that we can we can um, guide uh, uh, pre-select sperm cells uh, individually and also multiple of them uh, and deliver them nearby the, the old site. So um, of course, this uh, treatment will not compete with the natural conception because this is meant for, for, for infertility problems, especially when conventional treatments have been already uh, tried and, and none of them have worked for these couples. Uh, so this is the alternative to make the whole process under more natural conditions. We still have to evaluate what, what is the effect in in vivo conditions, but in principle is a non-invasive uh, technique uh, is uh, uh, utilizing very small structures in the order of few micrometer size with very thin layers of metals and oxides, uh, and uh, they can be even um, degrade, degrade uh, over time uh, with local enzymes. So we we are not expecting uh, really something uh, yeah uh, detrimental in this process, but yeah we still have to to see. Um, in vivo, what is, is the influence? And about the second question, um, yeah, there are different types of micro robots. Uh, they are um, typically classified by the locomotion principle. They can be either a chemical, for example, containing some catalyst materials or enzymes that can react with the surrounding media, like with glucose or urea, and move autonomously. Um, towards certain chemical gradients, for example, in the two more uh, vicinity is slightly uh, acidic. Uh, there is a slightly acidic pH, and this can be used for uh, guiding autonomously uh, some of these chemical micro robots. Um, there, there are also the physically um, driven ones, like the ones I show you, employing external physical fields like uh, magnetism or or light or ultrasound that can propel them uh, towards certain location using a feedback uh, imaging um, and uh, there are the bio hybrids that employ either um, motile cells or, or microorganisms that uh, have themselves already a uh, very efficient propulsion mechanism and, and recently there have been some more micro robotic or microelectronic uh, devices where they can integrate already energy on board uh, micro actuation sensors they are still a, a bit large, almost one millimeter size, but they are more like close to the real robots uh, and can potentially do uh, more complex operations in the future. But then you have other, other concerns, you know, how all these electronic components will uh, remain in the body or take out after performing certain tasks. And um, we are focused on assisted fertilization, but there are many other groups working on, on treating um, cancer, uh, like um, bladder cancer, for example, using chemically driven micro robots, or there have been also some uh, work uh, to treat um, 
skin uh, cancer using uh, um, um, magnetotactic bacteria. Uh, also uh, on the eye, there have been some work from uh, ETH Zurich uh, and uh, also uh, MPI in, in Stuttgart from uh, Professor Peter Fischer, uh, where they are using very tiny microhelical uh, motors uh, also to deliver certain uh, cargo in the in the eye, and uh, they are optimizing the, the surface functionalization so that they can move efficiently in the vitreous uh, liquid, which is highly viscous and dense. So yeah, uh, there are different approaches. They can be used also for microbiopsy, for local sensing. Um, this is in the biomedical field, but also there are some applications in the environmental field to, to, to treat um, and contaminate uh, waters, uh, water. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you, you already mentioned uh, different materials. Uh, we have another question on, on soft robotics. Um, I think Dan was the one who mentioned that uh, in the very beginning. And the question is, what would be the application of soft robots in biomedical engineering? At which scale? <laughs> micro, macro? <laughs> Maybe it's a question for you both. <laughs> but Outside I, I, I remember that, <laughs> that Dan uh, somehow uh, mentioned that uh, in the introduction part. But maybe it's uh, a question for you too. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to give to give it a shot. Um, there's there's I think there's lots of different applications that could benefit. So you could take soft robotic approaches to create flexible endoscopes that may have some more desirable properties that may be able to image better, that may be able to provide better access. You could use soft robotics in rehabilitation uh, scenarios um, to uh, to support uh, particular movements. You could use soft robotics to provide bedding, better imaging through kind of support structures, uh, if you like, um, that, that can position imaging probe or Im imaging devices. Um, so I think there's quite a plethora of different um, approaches. Um, some recent stuff that we've been doing is, for example, soft robotics to steer needles um, into difficult to access places or in places where you want to minimize the type of trauma. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of um, different, at, at, at my scale, the scale in which I'm working, there's a lot of different uh, applications. There's also a lot of challenges, uh, biocompatibility, safety, uh, repeatable control, and uh, you know, a whole plethora of, of stuff that's very difficult to do. Uh, but also there are desirable properties. Uh, you could build certain robots that are disposable and you know, if we can handle the disposability uh, ecologically, then uh, I think that could be really nice. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, different areas that could benefit. Yeah, Mariana, maybe you can, can add uh, some soft robotics in, in the micro scale. Uh, do they exist? <laughs> Yeah, there are also some uh, interesting works uh, that employ hydrogels uh, that either are biodegradable or also respond to different stimuli, for example, uh, local pH changes or local temperature changes. And this is very promising for, for um, triggering uh, the release of a cargo, either a cell or, or a small molecule uh, on the right location, uh, employing um, intrinsic um, um, yeah, if, uh, parameters like pH or temperature. Uh, they can also adapt in intricated channels. This is main, main, mainly the, the reason why uh, uh, soft robotics um, will be, I think, the future in this, uh, in this um, micro-robotic community because they, they, can, they, they, they are very soft. They can adapt to very small vessels and channels which are very intricated. And the the material itself can be smart, you no? Know, can be considered, uh, uh, let's say, the sensing and the actuation uh, structure by itself. Because uh, depending on on the stimuli, you you will have also a, a change, a shape change uh, that will be employed either for micro manipulation or for for releasing uh, a cargo in a on demand, let's say. So yeah, there are some words, not that many at the moment, but I, I think uh, a lot of people is moving towards this direction, yeah. Thank you, Mariana. Um, we have a question for uh, probably Dan, uh, which is how does augmented reality 
compare with virtual reality in the field of robotic surgery? So I think this is a question really around visualization. Uh, and maybe Nina could maybe um, respond in terms of how clinically useful that would be. Uh, would it be any use at all? So Dan, first of all. Um, I'd, I'd say that the two are very different. Um, so virtual reality, I think predominantly would be used for training, um, either training particular subtasks. It could also go to patient specific training, um, but I think there's some questions around that, but that would be the use of virtual reality. And then augmented reality, I guess, would be um, used to fuse information to provide image fusion or uh, image guided, uh, you know, enable image guided surgery. Um, I think uh, in, in that space, surgical robotics uh, systems as they are today, or at least the kind of telemanipulator systems are quite well suited uh, to provide augmented reality because you're already in a console, you're already looking at the digital picture of the surgical site, overlaying additional information is it's kind of a natural environment for it. I think uh, the use of headsets, um, you know, HoloLens and uh, devices like that, um, is a lot more complicated. Uh, they're not really built for surgery, um, you know, even, even from very basic things. So, you know, you could get debris from the operating room or operating site that can hit the device and then land back onto the patient so it can break the sterile barrier. So there's, there's a lot of things that need to be done in order to make devices like that, um, uh, one, usable, and two, actually useful. Um, because obviously the information that you're providing needs to warrant you wearing a headset for a few hours, which comes with its own challenges. So I think um, from the kind of head-mounted display headset technology point of view, I think it's still a piece of technology looking for a home in surgery. So I don't think there is a, a necessarily a very natural fit. But one will probably emerge. I mean, we've been looking at this for a very long time and it still keeps coming back. So it makes sense that something will, will break through. I'm just not exactly sure what yet. Um, thank you, Dan. And Nina, from your perspective, how easy it was to learn how to use the robotic system and how easy it is, is it to teach others to use it as well? So, in, you know, experienced surgeons and how does it work for you? Um, I think... It, the learning curve is from, it's been difficult if you're going for an open surgery, which is a traditional uh, where you make big cuts, etc. To robotics, it's been quite steep, but for my generation, we started off using 2D, which is a laparoscopic surgery, to actually going to three-dimensional. The learning curve is not that huge. It's the only difference is with the laparoscopic surgery, you get a much wider view, whereas two, with the robotic, you're almost a tunnel vision. So it's trying to get your mindset around working in a smaller area, but much better view and then moving along. But once you get the hang of it, there's multiple studies being done, but no one's actually come up with a decent figure. But in the UK, for governance purposes, they agreed is uh, in the part of the robotic committee is that 50 cases generally taken as where you are deemed proficient in robotics but this is not a randomized control trial of comparing one or the other this is just more of an anecdotal evidence of all the robotic surgeons in, in the UK and probably from external studies so training most of the robotic session uh, systems come with two consoles so you'll have a one surgeon operating on one console and then you're training, which I normally have sitting on the other console. And there's a quite a good uh, communication interlay between, and there is a, a arrows that you can draw on there and etc. So it's actually much easier to train someone on robotics than it was on laparoscopic because you both are looking at the same view. You can take control of the, or give control. So it's, I have personally found it, it's a lot more efficient than the laparoscopic surgery. Thank you, Nina. Anna. Uh, yeah, we, we have another question for, for Dan, I think, um, about uh, AI. Uh, how does AI revolutionize uh, surgery? Is the re uh, responsibility on the surgeon who, who uses the technique or are the scientists who develop them? I think that's the, the classical question about AI in, in different fields. Um, um, you have an answer. I mean, as, as the scientist, I would say it's all, all responsibilities with the surgeon. So uh, don't, don't blame me. 
Um, it always is. It always is. So I think the way that um, the way that current systems are deployed, responsibility is actually with the surgeons. So the system is um, the way that you regulate a, a system for clinical use is you 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 say you know you have a number of claims or you you have an intended use and you say what the system is able to provide. Um, but then how that information is used in order to make the clinical decisions is left to the to the expert. So they're all, they're all human in the loop AI systems today. Um, if you start providing interoperative diagnostic uh, information or, you know, the, I think, you know, maybe there are questions there that, that may change that. But I think uh, robotics companies traditionally have tried to shy away from uh, kind of the responsibility piece, which is where automation is, you know, that's one of the other challenges of automating certain things, because then you have to take accountability and responsibility for them, uh, which is very, very difficult. So I think for the time being, it, it will all be human in the loop and certainly we'll be relying on our expert uh, surgeons to, to make the, the hard decisions. Uh, how will AI revolutionize surgery? Um, Hopefully, by making life easier for experts like like Nina, uh, by either by doing things that currently take time today and are either not done or very you know or reduce the number of cases that could be done or have other uh, downstream effects, um, and and then you know in years to come, hopefully by also doing things that we just can't do today. So e even experts today only have so many hours in the day and can only do so many operations and only have so much kind of human visual uh, recognition capabilities and memory storage, you know, the brain is an infinite and we can't recall everything that we've ever done at, 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 at an instant. Um, so I think that's where AI systems could potentially really provide value. So you could have AI systems that are observing uh, a much larger number of cases that, that, than, than is humanly possible. And maybe they'll be able to discover, you know, so it's kind of discovery science. You might be able to discover things that are there, that are present, either spectral signatures or other anatomical signatures or other things that uh, are currently not picked up by humans just because we don't observe these events frequently enough for us to notice them. Um, but that's very much uh, a, a hypothesis and it's not to be proved, it's not proven yet. Thank you, Jan. I think we've got time for one, one uh, another question. Uh, where do the panelists see the biggest challenges of a widespread use of a robotic systems in clinics worldwide? Maybe Mariana, if you could maybe share your experience. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, where do the panelists see the biggest challenge of a widespread use of robotic systems in clinics worldwide? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the big challenge in our community is the translation, <laughs> the, the, just the, the clin so the clinical translation, and uh, also to to have uh, um, this uh, close connection to the clinicians and uh, the medical doctors, because uh, sometimes we are coming from uh, areas that are very specialized, uh, uh, like uh, material science or, or, or microfabrication, and we lose a little bit the perspective of what is really needed in the clinic, you know, and uh, yeah, the, I I think I I think that the big challenge is, is to really have these uh, different disciplines and and uh, and actors uh, together in a really um, a close uh, a communication and constant communication to to make this uh, happen in reality. Mm -hmm. But this is from my perspective because I'm I'm still doing very basic research. You no, know? maybe in the case of Nina and Dan, it's, it's, it's already different. <laughs> yeah, maybe Nina and, and Dan, can, can you also share your opinion on that? I think my, from my perspective, it's the financial side. So the current robot we own costs three millions and that's consumables extra and each consumable has a life span of about 12 procedures. So you could imagine that each, after 12 operations, we'll need to replace all those plus the running cost of the robot. So that's the biggest challenge around the UK with smaller hospitals being able to afford. And I could imagine that that would be the same with worldwide, with non, I don't know, large companies supporting smaller countries. Dan, what do you think? I think cost is a is a huge run. Um, I think 
also, I don't know the numbers, but I think today it's, you know, I think there's around 6,000 surgical robots in use, maybe a little bit more. Um, and currently it's only at about, I think, 3% of the total, total number of surgeries that are performed using robotics. So it's still scratching the surface, really. Um, and I think most of those are deployed in very developed, um, very well resourced hospitals uh, or private practices. Um, and so I think if we're looking at it from a societal perspective and a kind of humanity uh, challenge, I think it's how do you get technology like that to help all of the other patients um, that we need to help. Thank you, Dan. One last uh, question and it needs to be very brief. Um, do you see a possibility of using remote control robots for surgery on future missions on of space exploration? Uh, Dan, it's probably one for you. And B, yes. B please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I think it's um, people people have demonstrated, you know, I think the, the first uh, um, telesurgery was 20, 21 years ago. Um, France to, to the US, I think, uh, Strasbourg to New York or Paris to New York. So um, in, in those 20 years, there have been others. So people in China have done, have done a fair amount of it. There's new uh, trials starting. So it's certainly something that's feasible. Um, whether it's something that's sensible is a different, different question. Um, and maybe in space, it is sensible because uh, you've, you're constrained by where you are. So um, I think it, it certainly is something that probably will become available. I don't know how often, you know, I think astronaut, uh, astronauts are pretty well trained and pretty well inspected before they shot up there. So uh, I don't know how often it's necessary to do something like that. But I, I guess emergency and trauma, which is probably the most difficult thing to be doing uh, with a robot because it's unpredictable. Uh, uh, maybe it's some devices that are able to support uh, space missions will emerge. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think um, we've reached our end of our list of uh, uh, questions in the Q&A Q box, uh, Anna. Yeah, I think uh, that were perfect uh, futuristic words, uh, last futuristic words about our uh, today's topic. Um, it has been a fascinating hour and a half uh, learning about some robotics uh, for medicine. Um, we, we have learned from, from micro robotics, surgical robotics uh, and AI, AI uh, in the field of, of uh, using robots uh, in medicine. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for, for Dan, uh, Nina and Mariana being uh, on our panel uh, today. Um, this is typically the point where uh, I, I hand over some, some chocolates for our speakers. Uh, so today, just a very warm uh, thank you to, to all of you uh, being uh, on our panel today. Uh, and also thank you to, to everyone in the audience for, for asking questions, uh, which made our discussion a, yeah, a very lively one. Uh, I really enjoyed your questions and, and your, your answers and insights uh, into your field of research. And uh, also uh, thank you to the organizers uh, at the IOP and DPG site um, who put this event together, namely Natanya uh, Rodrigo Candapa uh, from the IOP, uh, Georg Dux and Ursel Franz from DPG site. Um, it has been a pleasure hosting uh, this, this event today and um, uh, please don't forget to, to write any suggestions uh, if you have some for an upcoming event like this. Uh, you, you can write it in the chat box uh, or directly to, to IOP or, or DPG. And uh, finally, we would really appreciate if you could fill a, a very short feedback on our poll uh, before you leave. That would really help us a lot for preparing our, our upcoming events. And with these words, uh, on behalf of IOP and DPG, many, many thanks to, to everybody uh, for joining this event and being part of our panel. And have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice evening.